Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today uh, we're going to take a look at another question from one of the fantastic Forgotten Weapons Patreon supporters. Uh, today it is Charles who says, I'd love to hear you do a deep dive on the commissioning and procurement process of the Shosha compared to the FAMAS or the HK416F, or the Sten versus the L85, or the Papa Shah 41 versus the AK-12, etc. The specific question I have is, quote, why does defense procurement take so much longer and cost so much more today than it did in the first half of the 20th century when national defense was a far more pressing concern? Well, Charles, I think there's actually a, a misunderstanding or an incorrect assumption built into the foundation of the question, because the trials and commissioning process for military small arms a hundred years ago was in fact an extremely expensive and time-consuming process. In fact, in many ways, a hundred years ago the procurement trials were actually more complex than they are today. One of the interesting things about uh, trials a hundred years ago is, first off, there were a lot of different companies that would often submit guns, and in a lot of cases, uh, for the United States in particular, they weren't limiting uh, submissions to these trials to just companies that could actually build the gun. So today, uh, you know, if, if we want to replace, for example, the M4, uh, trial or, uh, submissions are going to come from gun factories. FN maybe will submit a gun. Uh, Textron will submit a gun. Not a gun factory, but they could produce some stuff. SIG will submit a gun. These are companies that have a design and they can build that design and mass produce it. Well, a hundred years ago it was pretty common for inventors to submit like literally one-off examples of what a gun that they designed, that they built, that they thought would fit the army requirements. And you can see this in some of the like the early breech-loading rifle trials for the British and for the Americans as well. There will be dozens, sometimes more than a hundred different submissions to government requests for a new weapon. Because like I as an individual can hammer one out in my own workshop and submit it to the army, and maybe it'll work out. And if it does, the army has its own, or the nation has its own government-run arsenals that will be producing it. So countries weren't always concerned about whether a submission to a small arms program was actually being submitted by someone who, could, who owned a factory that could make it. Didn't matter, we find the gun that we want and then we'll make it ourselves. Royal Small Arms Factory Enfield, Springfield Armory, uh, you know, the, the different countries that have their own national gun factories. Today that's really not a thing anywhere. Uh, every country is essentially uh, relying on private industry to supply firearms. Um, in addition, with ye olde firearms trials, they had basically all the same sort of trials that they put each gun through that we do today. You'll see endurance trials, you know, many, many thousands of rounds through the guns. Uh, you'll see things like saltwater exposure trials. In some cases, trials that are rather more severe than we even do today. Like, we're gonna soak this gun in a barrel of sal ammoniac acid overnight, and then we're gonna leave it out in the rain for a week, and then we're gonna try shooting it and see what happens. Like, yeah, not surprisingly, most of the guns they put that through turned into rusty disasters. But uh, mud tests, sand tests, water tests, rain tests, all, all the stuff that you see people doing today was done back a hundred years ago. Now, the examples that you gave are have a different thing in common, and that is the difference between small arms procurement during a conflict and small arms procurement during peacetime. And that's where the big difference is. So the Shosha, for example, since you brought it up, the Shosha was initially designed as basically an aircraft machine gun. It didn't have a bipod, it didn't have a sling, it was mounted on an airplane. Uh, which by the way is part of the reason the open-sided magazine didn't matter, part of the reason that its ability, or its uh, capability to like lock up after extended fire, that didn't matter because the gun couldn't get hot because it was mounted on an airplane flying around in very cold air. Anyway, uh, the Shosha went through a development process up before World War I, and then kind of got sat on the sideline. It was never that important of a gun until 1915, when the French realize we absolutely need automatic rifles. Like, we've got to have a lot of automatic rifles to give to guys. This is a concept 
that uh, a type of firearm that we didn't think was important before the war, and now, now that we've been in a war for a little while, we're realizing that, holy cow, this is a really important thing that we need. Very similar, in fact, to the British rationale for the Sten gun. Before World War II, the British don't really see the submachine gun as a particularly relevant or important type of, of weapon. Um, uh, you, you'll see it around there sometimes. You know, look down their noses at those gangster guns, in particular Thompsons. And then the Germans go blitzkrieging through Europe using a whole lot of submachine guns, and the British, you know, boy me, we could really use some of those. And then they developed the Sten gun. So the thing about procurement during wartime, and maybe this is obvious, but it's worth pointing out, it's worth putting down, is uh, the standards get a bit relaxed during wartime. When there is an immediate need for a specific firearm, the procurement process becomes what do we have and what will actually fulfill the specific need that we see right now. Whereas during peacetime, the procurement process is more along the lines of what can be developed and what will best fit our needs. Uh, with a lot of contingencies. Like maybe we want something that's going to be multi-purpose and do a bunch of things. You get into wartime and actual fighting really clarifies a lot of situations and it becomes this is the specific role that I need this thing to make. I need an automatic rifle. I need a submachine gun. And the exact details are less important than will this be a submachine gun that I can have a whole lot of real fast. Uh, and that's that's sort of the situation where both the Sten and the Shosha were developed. They were, in the case of the Shosha, this was a gun that was close, like the the CS machine rifle, as it was called at that time, Shosha Sutter, uh, was the closest thing the French had to an in-production automatic rifle. It was meant for aircraft, but with a little bit of modification, you know, you flip the action upside down, you put a bipod on it, and okay, you can have an automatic rifle. And because it was better than anything else that was available in you know fairly short order, that's what they put into production. And the same with the Sten gun. The Sten wasn't in development before the war, but the Sten was the result of uh, a design that was developed very quickly that could be produced very quickly. Like, okay, we need a submachine gun, what can we do? Let's sketch out some stuff on a bar napkin, and yeah, that'll work. Let's do it. Now the downside to this sort of procurement is well, the upside is it saves a lot of time because you're not doing some of the testing. There is always testing to make sure that the design works, that the, the production uh, meets the specifications, but you're not doing a lot of comparative testing, and there's not a lot of what-ifs that are considered. It's just, here's the basic rule, will this fire 5,000 rounds? Yes, okay, good, move it along in the process. And as a result, you overlook a lot of things, and often that doesn't matter during the war, because it's more important to get that gun into service. But after the war you look at it and you realize, wow, we could have done, like, there's so many problems with this gun. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like characteristics of the Shosha and the Sten gun both? Uh, they were what was needed right then, but didn't last so well after the war. The French abandoned the Shosha very quickly. Uh, and gave a whole bunch of them away to everybody who really didn't have any choice but to accept charitable donations of surplus firearms. The British uh, revised the Sten gun into the Mark V, which was actually decent, and then replaced it fairly quickly with the Sterlings. Again, giving Sten guns to everybody who really couldn't afford to pay for anything that was better. Uh, the Papasha 41 versus AK-12 is a little bit of a different situation going on. Obviously the AK-12, uh, I'll leave it to everyone else who's already looked at the AK-12 to talk about uh, what went wrong in the development process there, but uh, Russian military procurement is notably corrupt and leads to results like the AK-12 from time to time. The Papasha 41 is actually a gun that was in development before the invasion of Russia. It was a gun that was specifically being designed to be inexpensive to manufacture, and so it did actually go through a lot of development. Um, it went through competitive trials against a couple of uh, compet well, competitive trials with a couple of their competitive machine guns, and was chosen, uh, and then was refined into a bit of an even simpler design to make. So. Um, the Papasha doesn't quite fall into this, this same category of procurement 
emergency procurement during wartime. That would be more like emergency simplification and production during wartime. But the Sten and the FAMAS I think are both outstanding examples of uh, the trade-off between I need it right now versus I'm, and I'm willing to accept that there are going to be some shortcomings and some problems that we're not going to take the time to fix. So, um, the L85 is actually in some ways has some of the same sort of problems as the AK-12. It was a hugely, uh, it was a terribly run development program for the L-85, largely because of bureaucratic overhead. Um, the FAMAS actually is a pretty good example of a typical peacetime uh, development program. It took about 10 years, 8 or 10 years. Uh, the rifle was developed from some basic requirement principles, uh, and slowly iterated getting better and better and better as the development progressed until they have a final version. They start putting it into production, then as is kind of typical they go, oh crap, there were a couple last minute things that we need to change, like oh let's throw in a burst mechanism. Uh, and then the gun goes into production and didn't really have any hugely substantial problems once it did get into production, and it stayed in service for several decades. So. Um, the L85 is similar once you get past all of the fixing that they had to do to it. Um, the 416, kind of similar, it was a, didn't take quite as long because it was a gun that was already in commercial production instead of something that was developed specifically for the French military from the ground up. But Anyway, uh, now I'm just rambling, so hopefully this did a decent job of answering your question. Uh, we will continue to do a couple of uh, questions like this each week. If you are interested in having your question answered, you are encouraged to sign up on Patreon or Utreon, uh, and I have threads running on both of those platforms where you can submit questions to be answered in a format like this. Thank you very much for watching.